Hello class, happy Monday. Let's get into, like we're just gonna jump into it right away because we have so much to get through. Uh, today is, I'm not gonna like sugarcoat it, a very detail-oriented day. We have reached the true culmination of our acid-based discussion where we started this uh, you know, discussion in early chapter 16, relearning what pH is, what acids and bases are, and every step of the way we've been adding like a new level of complexity. Uh, we've added the common ion effect, we have now put back in neutralization reactions and calculating the pH before and after neutralization. Uh, we have to be asking ourselves again, what is in the beaker? What is the timeline? Where am I either before the reaction, during the reaction, or after the reaction in order to calculate what's the pH? What are my concentrations? Today, we are going to revisit the concept of titration, the uh, analytical technique that is used to determine unknown concentrations, and what we're going to be doing today is also tying pH into uh, titration calculations. So we're gonna start with a bit of a review of chapter nine, the last bits of material we talked about last fall before deep diving into uh, the chapter 17 material. So let's just get into it. Okay, so revisiting again chapter nine, what is the definition of a titration? Well, a titration is a form of chemical analysis and its main purpose is to determine an unknown concentration specifically of an acid or a base a lot of the time. In order to perform a titration, we use this fancy uh, piece of glassware that is illustrated to the right. This is known as a burette. Uh, a burette is sort of like a fancy combination between a pipette and a graduated cylinder. Uh, we can see that there's this like little nozzle down here. This little nozzle is kind of like the pipette piece. Uh, the graduated marks up above, we can see that there are tick marks on the upper half of the burette. This is like the graduated cylinder half. So it's a very large pipette where we have very distinct graduated markings. We know exactly how much volume, there, volume from the burette that we are adding into whatever solution is present down below it. If we know the concentration of the uh, substance that is up above, whatever its molarity is, and we know how much of that substance we have added into our unknown, well, we can use that to calculate how much uh, like stuff was in this kind of question mark unknown, whether it be an acid or a base, and use that then to calculate a concentration. And we'll be seeing an example of those older types of calculations in a second. We perform a titration, uh, up until what is called the equivalence point. Uh, the neutralization reaction then is like quote unquote finished once we hit the equivalence point of the reaction. The equivalence point is the point of the neutralization when the acid and the base have totally neutralized. Um, in other words, the molar amounts of the acid and the base that get added are in stoichiometric ratio. A lot of the time in acid-base reactions, since the uh, protona, pro, protonation, yes, of, um, or the deprotonation of our acid occurs step by step, the stoichiometric coefficients out in front of your acid and base tend to be one. So in other words, your neutralization reaction is complete so long as the molar amount uh, of your HCl is equal to the molar amount of your NaOH in this example. So if we had one mole of HCl, uh, and we knew what, you know, the concentration was, this is a known, we hit the equivalence point, well, that must mean that we have just neutralized one mole of the NaOH. If there were two moles of HCl initially, when we neutralize two moles of NaOH, this is an equivalence point, dot, 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 etc. All right, so let's look at an example of this type of equivalence point titration problem from last semester. This problem is very similar to a problem that we actually worked through uh, when, when talking about acid-base chemistry in chapter nine. So if you do have your notebook, I would encourage you to go back through that material, that acid-base discussion. Uh, in this example, we have a 30 milliliter sample of HCl. It's titrated with a 0.1 molar solution of NaOH. So notice that we don't have a concentration provided for our HCl. 
This means that the HCl, our strong acid, is our unknown in this case. We don't know what its concentration is. But a volume of 20 milliliters of NaOH was added to neutralize the HCl. So from this information, we can find what the concentration of the original HCl solution was. And we can do this using, let's see, where do I want to write it? Stoichiometry. Since we are working with a strong acid, strong base neutralization, as we talked about last Friday, anytime a strong acid or a strong base is in the flask and is undergoing a neutralization reaction, the reaction is complete. So our HCl will completely neutralize or be neutralized by, they're going to neutralize each other, the NaOH giving us a complete reaction, forwards reaction arrow, giving us our salt water as a product. So if there are equal moles at the equivalence point of these species, we know what volume of our NaOH we added to get to the equivalence point, and we know the concentration of our NaOH. So we can use this information to find how many moles of NaOH were added at the equivalence point. That must be equal to the number of moles of HCl that were present initially in the flask. So uh, this just comes down to dimensional analysis and stoichiometry. If the, uh, we have 20.0 milliliters um, of the NaOH, there are 1,000 milliliters per every one liter, and we have a 0 0.10 mole per liter solution. It should be a one. Uh, this means that if we are at the uh, equivalence point and all of the moles of the NaOH have been neutralized, well, that means that there were 0 0.00, uh, is it 0 0 0.0020 0 moles. I want to make sure I have my zeros right. This is important. Uh, there were 0 0.002 moles of NaOH added to the flask to reach the neutralization point, to uh, reach the equivalence point. What this means is that the molar amount must have been equal to the same number of moles of HCl that were present in the flask in order for all of the uh, HCl to have neutralized, right? The number of moles here must be equal to the number of moles of the HCl that were present. Uh, so if our original question, right, was like, what's the original or concentration of the HCl solution? We have the number of moles now, right? It's equal to 0 0.002 moles since the molar amount is equivalent, 0 0.0020 moles of HCl. And the original volume of our HCl was 30 milliliters, meaning we're going to be taking 0 0.002 uh, moles divided by 0 0.030 liters to give us a concentration uh, that is equal to 0 0.0667 molar. All right, so that's how much HCl was present initially before we, uh, you know, even titrated. This was the unknown concentration. So this is the purpose of titration. If we have an unknown concentration of an acid or a base, we can perform a titration. Once we hit the equivalence point, the molar amounts of our acid and base must be equal, and we can use that information then to kind of backtrack and figure out, based on what the uh, initial volume was, what was our initial concentration. Now, since we've been talking about pHs, we're also going to be tying pH into the titration. Uh, so a really common question is, what is the pH at the equivalence point? And the reason why this is a commonly asked question, uh, we will see in a split second. But let's just address the strong acid, strong base case first. Well, we are not looking at the initial pH. We're looking at the pH at the equivalence point. And by definition, at the equivalence point, all of our acid and all of our base have been used up. We don't have any left. So the pH at the equivalence point is going to be dependent on the products that are in solution. And we saw a little bit of this last Friday as well when we started introducing neutralization reactions and buffers. Uh, whatever your products are, if there is a conjugate acid or a conjugate base present, that will define what your pH is more than likely going to end up being. 
Now, if we look at the products from our strong acid, strong base neutralization, we see that we have a neutral salt, right? There is no conjugate acid or base in sodium chloride, and we have water. Since there is a neutral salt and just distilled water, what this means is that at the equivalence point of this neutralization, our pH is equal to seven, right? There is no HCl left over. There is no NaOH left over. There's only salt water. And the pH of salt water is a neutral seven. But as I said, we want to look at the pH at the equivalence point. The reason why is it's not always going to be equal to seven. I mean, for HCl and NaOH, that at the equivalence point, that pH will always be equal to seven. But I mean, if we're looking at other reactions, our pH at the equivalence point will not always be equal to seven. Uh, for example, if we were to perform a titration of a weak acid or base, our pH at the equivalence point actually ends up being either less than or greater than seven. So to understand this, let's look at two different neutralization reactions. Our first is up above. This is a uh, weak acid neutralization. And down below, our case number two is a weak base neutralization. Uh, our weak acid in the first case is acetic acid. We can see that there's this extra H hanging out on the right hand side. This is the H that is going to end up uh, being neutralized by our NaOH. The OH piece being the actual basic piece of the component or of the uh, compound. When the neutralization reaction progresses, we have this H and OH combining together to form our water. And what's left over, our sodium acetate, becomes the sodium acetate on the product side. Now at the equivalence point, again, all of our reactant is used up. We have no acetic acid, we have no sodium hydroxide if we are at the equivalence point. We are only gonna have sodium acetate and water. Now, if the question becomes, what is the pH at the equivalence point? Suddenly now, if we like completely ignore the fact that there was just a titration reaction and just focus on the products that are on the right hand side, now we see that we have a case where we have salt, some type of ionic salt in water. Uh, and as we talked about last, was it Monday or Wednesday? I think it was Wednesday. Last Wednesday, uh, when you have some type of ionic salt in water, there's going to be a dissociation reaction. Right, this sodium acetate will break down into aqueous sodium and aqueous CH3COO minus. And this CH3COO minus is a conjugate base, right? It's the conjugate base of acetic acid. Uh, and since we have a conjugate base present, after the neutralization of acetic, or, uh, yeah, acetic acid with um, sodium hydroxide is complete and we have some conjugate base present, what this means is that the pH at the equivalence point of this uh, titration neutralization reaction above is going to be greater than seven. The second reaction that we can look at, we have a weak base present. Our weak base here is ammonia. Uh, at the equivalence point, we're gonna have equal parts ammonia and strong acid HCl. It doesn't matter what strong acid you choose or for that matter what strong base was chosen in the previous reaction. Uh, HCl and NaOH are the most common cases, the most common strong and uh, strong acid, strong base examples. So I'm gonna stick with those for this lecture. At the equivalence point, we will have equal parts ammonia and HCl, meaning that they will completely neutralize each other and we will only be left with our products. Our product in this case is an NH4 plus and a Cl minus. This could have been written as some type of ionic salt, them coming together. Uh, but I kind of jumped that step and already have the uh, products written out in dissociated form. So we can observe the NH4 plus and the Cl minus and ask ourselves, will either of these act as a weak acid or weak base when present around uh, water? And the answer is yes. Our NH4 plus is a conjugate acid. Since we have a conjugate acid present still in solution after the complete neutralization of our ammonia with HCl, this means that the pH at the equivalence point of this weak base um, titration is going to be less than seven. And so the takeaway message here is if you are working with a weak acid uh, being titrated by a strong base, your pH at the equivalence point, as we saw in this example, will be greater than seven. This is true for all weak acid strong base titrations.
In the second example, we looked at a weak base being titrated with a strong acid, and our pH was less than 7. Similarly, this is going to be true for every weak base plus strong acid titration that we could perform. Our uh, pH in this type of example is always going to be less than 7. Okay, so now that we have addressed pHs, uh, exactly how much greater than 7 or how much less than 7 the pH is going to be at the equivalence point for these examples will specifically depend on what weak acid or weak base you're working with, but we can perform those calculations and we're actually going to be seeing that a little bit later today. What we are first going to address though is if you're actually in the lab, what signals the end of a titration? Right, we've been just saying, oh hey, the equivalence point was found to be this volume, but like, how do we know? Well, we oftentimes use chemical indicators. Uh, the end or the equivalence point is oftentimes signaled during a titration by some type of indicator, which, and here's the big, the big point, which changes color at a particular pH. The pH with which uh, an indicator changes color is known as the end point. Uh, and the reason why we call this the end point is it signals the end of your titration, right? You've reached the equivalence point, your reaction's done. So at some type, uh, or in some flask here, we have some uh, acid present. This could be a strong acid, it could be some type of weak acid, doesn't really matter. Uh, and our base is going to be in the burette up above. We can see that the nozzle of the burette is pointing down into the flask, meaning that when we start the titration, uh, the base is going to be moving into the flask through this like little nozzle. Now, the indicator that is present inside of this flask is called phenolphthalene. And I didn't have to look at how to spell that word. That's just a word that like you see it so many times in chemistry and eventually, even though it's crazy looking, you will learn it. Uh, phenolphthalene is a uh, colorless in acid. But as we start adding base, uh, as the reaction is progressing, right, we're adding some base now into the flask, we get this like little swirly of pink. The swirling of pink is the uh, presence of a more like basic pocket of the solution. So we would continue to swirl the solution, mixing, 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 until eventually all of the solution here has turned pink. What this uh, signals is that we actually have some excess base. We've gone a little bit beyond the equivalence point. We want there to be a very, very faint pink when working with phenolphthalein, and that marks that you are just at the equivalence point. But the important like visual here is that we get a color change, and some uh, indicators will signal the uh, you know their end point or will signal the equivalence point of a titration with very vibrant color changes, and every indicator has a are an end point at a unique pH. So if we're working with the titration of a weak acid and strong base that has a uh, pH change at the equivalence point that's greater than seven, we can pick out an indicator that has an end point that's also greater than seven. Uh, contrast, if we're working with a weak um, base and a strong acid titration, where the pH is going to be less than seven, we can grab an indicator where the pH is going to change or the, um, the indicator will change color at a pH that is less than seven. So here uh, we have the definition of a pH indicator, more like technically worded. A pH indicator is a weak acid or a weak base itself. Um, the fun part about indicators though is that they change color dependent on what their equivalence points are. So uh, on this chart down below, we have a bunch of different indicators present on this Y axis. These are indicators we can see the color changes that occur uh, as the you know, acid base, the pH changes of the indicator itself. So crystal violet, the one that's like first up on our list, we can see is going to be this yellow color at uh, like more or in more of an acidic range. It turns green at approximately a pH of one, and then it's blue for everything that is more basic than that. And that's kind of how we're reading this chart overall. We could extend these bars like all the way across the chart, but the point of interest to us is the end point, which is kind of like at the central center part of each of these uh, colored brackets. Um, thymol blue we can see actually has two end points. So it's a really nice indicator if you're working with uh, a titration that its equivalence point is either very acidic or very basic. Phenolphthalein is right here. So the uh, 
like color change point is actually right here, just above a pH of eight. So that's kind of how we're reading this chart. Um, the compound of uh, phenolphthalein is actually illustrated here. Again, it is colorless in acidic conditions. As you add base to uh, the solution where the indicator is present, we can actually see that there's a structural change. This bond right here is what breaks when you add a base. Um, in the structural rearrangement then, as this bond now is broken, we can see that the CO2 piece is now kind of like off. It's not connected to the molecule where it previously was. This structure uh, has a pink color to it. So this is exactly how indicators work. All of them have structural differences at different pHs, which because of the structural differences, we can see different colors. Okay, so we've introduced indicators. These are the things that we use to signal visually when a reaction, when a titration is finished, when we've hit our equivalence point. Since we are talking about the pH though, uh, you know, of a neutralization reaction. We've talked about the pH at the equivalence point, but what about the pH before the equivalence point and the pH afterwards? Well, we can uh, draw out a graph, which currently is blank. We're gonna be filling in the dots here in a little bit. Uh, we can map pH as a function of volume of whatever the substance is that you're, uh, you know, titrating with. What we're gonna look at first is an example of a uh, unknown strong acid being titrated with a strong base. So the strong base is in the burette up on top. The strong acid is what is exactly like in this flask right here. The volume then that we are going to be adding or measuring is the volume of the base. There's going to be some point where we hit the equivalence point. I'm just going to draw that halfway down. Since we're talking about the neutralization of a strong acid with a strong base, even before doing any calculation, we can assume that the pH at the equivalence point is going to be equal to 7. Uh, so let's just draw, you know, an in, uh, uh, intercept of 7 equal here. So our first point, we're just going to draw right there, right? If you're at the equivalence point, you have added enough... Uh, of your strong base to hit the equivalence point, your pH is seven, specifically because, again, we're working with a strong acid, strong base. But what does everything else look like on this graph? Is it a linear relationship? Is it sinusoidal? Is it logarithmic? Is it exponential? There are so many different mathematic relationships that we could possibly draw from. So what we're going to do is perform a couple of calculations before the equivalence point and another one after the equivalence point, just to get an idea for what the shape of this possible relationship is going to look like. Okay, so here we have a strong acid titration. Again, the problem we're working with here corresponds to the previous graph that we're trying to fill in. And this may seem like busy work, and to a degree it sort of is, but this is also very useful information, uh, being able to understand the relationship between pH uh, as it changes throughout the course of a titration. Now, not to get distracted, the strong acid titration we are going to be working with, we have 30 milliliters of an HCl solution. Uh, again, we are not told what the concentration of this HCl solution is if we continue reading in the problem. So this is our current unknown. It is being titrated with a 0.1 molar NaOH solution. Uh, we are going to be calculating the pH after the following volumes of sodium hydroxide have been added. We have four different data points. We have the first, which is before any of the H or uh, before any of the sodium hydroxide has been added, 10 milliliters, 20 milliliters, which we are told is when the equivalence point is, and 30 milliliters. And again, here we have the balanced chemical equation below. If we observe the uh, information that is immediately present to us. There's, I mean, so many different directions that we can go, right? There's a lot being asked of us. So where do we start? Where I uh, suggest starting is the equivalence point. Reason being is we don't actually know the concentration of the HCl and it's the equivalence point that's going to give us that information. The equivalence point will tell us what that unknown concentration of HCl is. And that way, once we have the concentration of the HCl, we can actually use that to solve for the pH at the rest of the data points uh, that we're going to be working with at zero milliliters base added, 10 milliliters base added, and the 30 milliliters base added. But we can't do those other three calculations yet until we know what the concentration of our HCl is. So we are going to start exactly at the equivalence point.
how we can start this calculation is the exact same way that we started the previous calculation, right? If we ignore the rest of the data that's being told to us, we have a known volume for HCl, which is 30 milliliters. We don't know its concentration. Uh, we know exactly how much of the NaOH was added, 20 milliliters at the equivalence point, and we know its concentration, 0.1 molar. So in this type of problem, it's going to be very helpful to organize your information so you can kind of lay out what's useful for me right now versus what can I ignore because it's going to be useful for me later. The data that we have just pulled out, 30 milliliters uh, of our HCl, 20 milliliters of our sodium hydroxide, here's the 0.1 molar that is known. This is the exact same setup as the previous example problem. The reason why I did this is it's gonna save us a little bit of work right now because we've already seen the work, right, C, previous example, we've already seen the work that tells us what the concentration of our HCl is. We already solved for it. The concentration of our HCl, according to the work that we did previously, is 0.0667 molar. So now we're here. At the equivalence point, we have uh, again reiterated that our concentration of our HCl initially was uh, 0.0667. This is now useful information to us uh, in order to solve the rest of the data points that we are curious about. So I'm gonna clear the slide quick. And I'm going to rewrite that our concentration of HCl was 0.0667 molar. And our 20 milliliters equivalence point data point we have already also addressed. We're trying to find the pH at each of these data points but we have already acknowledged that because this is a strong acid, strong base uh, titration, the pH at the equivalence point in this case is going to be equal to seven. So done. One of our four problems is finished. It kind of felt like cheating, but it was clever cheating. I set it up this way on purpose. Let's look at the surrounding data points though, right? This was kind of the reason why we got into this problem is we're trying to figure out what is the relationship between pH during a titration and the amount of our strong base that is being added. So let's just start at the beginning. We have not added any of our strong base. 0, 0.0 milliliters means 0, 0.0 milliliters of NaOH added. We have not added any base. There is no neutralization reaction. We only have HCl. And we now know what the concentration of the HCl is because we just solved for it um, or rather, we, in this lesson, solved for it a couple of slides ago. Uh, definitely go back and review that if you would like to see that again. But we have it. We have that information. In order to solve for the pH, then, all we need, again, to find a pH is a negative log of concentration of H+. Here we have HCl, which dissociates into H+. The pH before any base has been added is going to be the negative log of the concentration of the HCl, the negative log of 0.0667 molar. And what this means is before the titration begins, right, we again have not added any sodium hydroxide, no titration is occurring. If we're just looking at the flask of HCl that is sitting underneath the burette, nothing's been added, the pH inside of this or vessel is going to be equal to 1.18. It is very acidic. Makes sense. We have a relatively high concentration of a very strong acid. We should have a very acidic pH. All right, if you have any questions at this point, uh, kind of take a pause, go back, rewatch the steps that we have done so far the steps uh, in calculating what the concentration of our HCl was, the pH at the equivalence point, and now we have also completed calculating the pH at 0, 0.0 milliliters. It's 1.18. What this is going to do for us, just to go backwards a slide, let's say equivalence point in this case is a volume that is equal to 20 milliliters since that was told to us. We have Data point for 10 milliliters here, 0, 0.0 milliliters will be here, and 30 
milliliters will be out here. So we're kind of spacing out evenly based on the data points that we are calculating where we are on the pH curve. Uh, let's see, this means that halfway here is 3.5, halfway down again is a 1.75. So we are sitting, let's see, somewhere around here. Uh, maybe a little bit higher. We're somewhere less than the pH of 1.75. We are at a low pH, uh, and this makes sense, right? We're working with a strong acid that uh, is going to have a very low pH if it's just pure strong acid. Cool, so we have two data points so far, two data points with which we can draw a curve or some type of correlation between our data. We have two more to go. Having cleared the slide, I will rewrite those pHs that we have, 1.18 uh, for before the titration has begun, a pH that is equal to seven at the equivalence point, and again, our concentration of HCl is 0 0.0667 molar. All right, next up, we have 10 milliliters. So we are halfway to the equivalence point, right? If the equivalence point is at 20 milliliters, we've added 10, we're halfway there. Let's see what the pH looks like halfway to the equivalence point when we are working with the titration of a strong acid, strong base. So uh, how I like to solve this type of problem is I like to, much in the same vein as like the ice table kind of problem, but it's not an ice table. Um, I like to organize all of my information for this type of problem beneath each of the molecules that we are working with, you know, beneath each of our reactants. So I'm just gonna organize our information since there are so many different problems, it pays to organize all of our information. We have 30 milliliters of HCl, uh, and that HCl has a concentration of 0 0.0667 molar. At this step of the problem, we have added 10 milliliters of NaOH, and it has a concentration of 0 0.10 molar. What this means is at this stage, there's going to be some type of complete reaction where we will have a theoretical yield of our pH neutral kind of products, and we will have an excess reactant because we have not reacted both of our substances, right? Both of our reactants in stoichiometric ratio. Our goal is to figure out which of these two things is the limiting reactant, question mark. And uh, in that same vein, how much excess is there? Once we know how much excess there is, we can use the excess reactant to calculate what our pH is. So that's kind of where we're going. We need to figure out which of our reactants was entirely used up and how much of the other reactant is there still left over. In order to do this, we have to uh, convert our calculations uh, or our measurements as they are currently into the unit of the mole, right? If we're working with uh, neutralization reactions or any type of reaction really, as we have been performing these calculations like going all the way back to chapter eight, if we're working with stoichiometry, you need to be in the unit of the mole. So what we're gonna do is use the volume and concentration information, uh, converting our units, multiplying these things together to figure out what uh, what our molar amount of HCl is and what our molar amount of NaOH is. In performing this calculation, which I leave to the viewer, uh, the amount of moles that we have of our HCl is 0 0.002 moles, and the amount of our NaOH is 0 0.001 moles. And the shortcut, just to remind you that we learned last week, was if we are working with a reaction that is a one-to-one, -one, all we're going to do is compare the molar amounts that are sitting down here. Whichever one is the lesser is going to correspond to the limiting reactant, which tells us since we have less NaOH present uh, at this step of the reaction, our NaOH is the limiting reactant it will be entirely used up over the course of this titration. There will be some excess HCl. Um, how we calculate the amount of excess HCl is we're gonna subtract out the amount that we just lost due to the uh, neutralization with sodium hydroxide. And because everything's a one-to-one, -one, the amount that we lose should be equal in value to the amount of the NaOH that we had. So we're going to take 0.002 moles, subtract out 0.001 moles, meaning that we have 0.001 moles 
of HCl in excess. If we want to calculate now the pH at this point, in order to calculate a pH, we need a concentration, right? We need pH equal to negative log concentration of H plus, not just molar amount of H plus. So the question is, what's our concentration? What volume do we divide this 0 0.001 moles by? Because we can't just divide it by our initial volume measurement of HCl. In the titration that we have just performed, here's our flask, here's our burette, we have added 10 milliliters, 10 milliliters of our NaOH into the flask. We might have had 30 milliliters in here to start with, but now we have a total that has increased. We have diluted the molar amount of HCl that is present. So in order to figure out what our concentration of HCl is, we're going to take our 0 0.001 moles and divide it by the new total volume that is inside the flask. We don't, uh, we are not going to be just using the initial volume measurement, we need a total volume measurement. And the total volume measurement is right here. It is the sum of the 30 milliliters that we started with and the 10 milliliters that we added. So our concentration will end up being 0.001 moles, all divided by 30 milliliters plus 10 milliliters. Uh, and we would need to convert these into liters, not just milliliters, but I'm just gathering total volume information down below. Uh, in con or calculating what our concentration is, converting to make sure that we are in the proper units, our concentration of HCl ends up being 0 0.025 molar. This is what we can use now to calculate what the pH is halfway to the equivalence point. Our pH is going to be equal to the negative log of 0 0.025 molar, which gives us a 1.61. So before we started our titration, our pH was 1.18. Halfway to the equivalence point, our pH is still incredibly low. Our pH is still 1.61. We're not halfway to the equivalent, or we're not halfway to the pH at the equivalence point. We are still very, very acidic. And this makes sense. We don't have any base in solution right now, aside from whatever uh, small amount of OH is present from the dissociation of water. There is no OH minus present from this strong base. There is only HCl. Everything else is pH neutral. So if we go back to our pH curve, uh, and we're still kind of filling in the, in the blanks here, halfway to our volume of the equivalence point, our pH is still about here. We have a very, very tiny pH. Uh, we can, or we're starting to get an idea though for the shape of the relationship uh, between pH and the volume, in this case, of base that is being added. It's not a linear relationship. It is some type of apparently exponential relationship. Our question though is, does the pH remain uh, here? Like, is this still an exponential growth or what happens on the other side of our equivalence point where our pH is equal to seven? Let's calculate that. We have one more data point to go. What is the pH at a volume measurement of 30 milliliters of our base being added? So we have 1.18, 7. <laughs> now, to calculate the pH beyond the equivalence point of this strong acid, strong base titration, we are going to organize our information in much the same way we did in the previous calculation. We're going to organize all of the information that is actually useful to us at this stage of the calculation. There was 30 milliliters of HCl in the beginning. Uh, its concentration is 0 0.0667 molar. At this stage, we have now added a total of 30 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, and its concentration still was a 0 0.10 molar. We, before, wanted to determine what our limiting and or excess reactants were. And we're going to do that again. 
We're going to continue doing that so long as our reaction is a complete reaction, which it will be if we have at least one strong acid or strong base present as a reactant. Uh, in order to figure out what our limiting slash excess reactant is, again, we have to make sure that our values, our measurements are in moles. That way we can actually calculate stoichiometrically how much is being used up and how much is left over. The molar amount of our HCl uh, in taking our volume times our concentration is going to be a 0.002 moles, the same as it was previously. The amount that's going to be different now is the amount of our NaOH that we are adding. If we take our 30 milliliters, convert it into liters, and multiply it by our concentration here, we will get a uh, measurement of 0.003 moles. And again, whichever of these two molar amounts is the lesser tells us what our limiting reactant is. And now we can see a case where it's not the sodium hydroxide that is the limiting reactant. Since now we are past the equivalence point, we are adding excess NaOH. And so it makes sense that our HCl now is going to be our limiting reactant. The amount of our HCl then is going to be completely used up, right? We're going to use up all of our 0.002 moles, leaving us with a total of 0.0 moles left over. It is the limiting reactant. The uh, sodium hydroxide, we're also going to subtract out 0.002 moles, and this leaves us with a total of 0.001 moles left over. This is the amount then that we are going to use to calculate what is the concentration of our OH- present in solution. Since ultimately we are looking for a pH, we'll have to figure out what the concentration of our H plus is from the amount of OH that is still present in solution. All right, so we can use this molar amount to calculate what our concentration of OH is by taking this 0.001 moles and divide it by our total volume. Our total volume in this case, we can see how much solution now has been, uh, or what volume of our solutions have been added together to give us this new total volume. So our concentration more explicitly is going to be 0.001 moles divided by 0.060 liters. Right, so the sum of 30 milliliters and 30 milliliters is 60 milliliters. You convert that into liters, that gives you 0.060. So the total concentration of our OH minus uh, is 0.0167 molar. And we can use this to figure out what our concentration of H plus is, since our concentration of H plus will be our Kw, which is 10 to the negative 14, all divided by the concentration that we just found, the 0.0167 molar, right? That's the concentration of our OH minus. This gives us an H plus concentration of 6.0 times 10 to the negative 13th molar, very, very tiny amount of H plus, which makes sense uh, because the only H plus now that is present in solution is due to the dissociation of our water. Uh, our concentration, or uh, pH, due to this concentration then, I'll write it up here, pH is equal to the negative log of the concentration of 6.0 times 10 to the negative 13, and the pH that results from this calculation is a 12.22. 12.22 is a very basic solution indeed. Going back to our pH curve, uh, let's see, Seven, so this up here would be 14, uh, halfway between would be like 10.5. So we're looking at a pH that is approximately here at the volume of 30 being added, maybe even a little bit, a little bit higher. The relationship here though is not going to be a linear relationship in much the same way that we had some type of curve present working our way up almost like an exponential increase to the equivalence point. Beyond the equivalence point, we get a curve, but it is turned over. The curve then whoop, ends up looking a little bit like this. So our equivalence point is what we call mathematically an inflection point. It is where two curves of opposing curviness meet. Uh, in other words, below the, uh, the pH that is the equivalence point, like below the equivalence point, we have almost like a bowl, like it is curving facing upwards, 
And beyond the equivalence point, we have a pH curve that is now curving downwards, right? The openness is like down below. And the equivalence point, this pH, is the exact moment where this turnover occurs. This shape we call a logarithmic curve. Um, this type of curve is a form of a logarithmic curve. Uh, the reason why logarithmic curves here make sense is because pH is a logarithmic measurement. So we can ask ourselves the question then, what does the pH curve look like if our uh, titration was the inverse? If we had a strong base down below in our flask and it was the strong acid that was being added inside. Well, without going through all of the calculations that we had just done, now that we have seen that the relationship is uh, logarithmic between, or rather before and after, the equivalence point has been hit. Again, we know that we are here working with strong acids and strong bases, meaning that at the equivalence point, our pH is going to be equal to seven. So being able to evaluate what substances we're working with is going to help give you a lot of information without even, even having to step foot in the lab. All right, so if our pH of seven is halfway up uh, and here is our equivalence point, that means that our inflection point is going to be here in the center of our graph. Before any acid is added into the vessel, we add a zero volume measurement, uh, or zero being like the point that's right here. Our pH, because we're working with a base, we would assume is going to be very, very high. So our pH is going to be uh, up here initially. Halfway to the equivalence point, we have added enough acid to neutralize a little bit, but not a ton. So our pH is more than likely going to end up being here. And after the equivalence point where we have only excess strong acid, our pH is going to plummet and will more than likely be down here. If we fill in the gaps between, let's see if I can do this in one fell swoop, curve down and swoop. Yeah, we end up with a curve that looks like the vertical mirror image of the curve that we just created for the uh, unknown being the strong acid and our titrant or whatever was in the burette being our strong base. In this case now we're starting with base and as the titration progresses, we can see that it slowly becomes more acidic. And once we pass the equivalence point, there is only excess acid remaining. And so we would assume that we're going to have suddenly like even one drop beyond the equivalence point, it's going to have a very, very low pH due to the excess acid. If we wanted to perform specific calculations, we could. In fact, there will be plenty of homework for you to do surrounding this type of concept uh, or this type of problem. So you will be getting more practice, don't you worry. All right, welcome back from that intermission. I wanted to give you a break, me a break. We all need a break. We've worked through one already really intense uh, titration problem. If you wanna take a break for the day and come back to the second half later, feel free. Uh, but I wanna make sure that we're coming back at it like with a fresh perspective. What we're going to be looking at now is not the titration of a strong acid, with a strong base or even a strong base with a strong acid. Now we are going to be looking at the titration of a weak acid. The titration of a strong acid with, or weak acid with a strong base is similar to the strong acid with the strong base, but the shape of the pH curve is going to be a little bit different. Uh, we're still gonna be starting uh, if we're doing a zero milliliter, let's say, 10 milliliter, 20 milliliters will be our equivalence point again, and 30 is beyond, just so we can kind of keep it consistent with the previous example. The initial pH uh, before any addition of the strong base, so if we're sitting at this kind of initial condition, zero milliliter strong base added, our pH of the weak acid is going to be a little bit higher than that of the strong acid. Specifically where it is, is going to depend for sure on exactly what weak acid we're looking at or working with, but the pH will be a little bit higher. And this has to do uh, with a weak or partial dissociation. 
of H plus when compared to a strong acid. The equivalence point pH is also not going to be exactly at seven. So we've uh, discussed already when mixing a weak acid and a strong base and they neutralize at the equivalence point, your pH is going to be slightly greater than seven. And the reason being is once you have added enough strong base to completely neutralize your weak acid and you have neither of these left, uh, in the reaction you will have produced conjugate base. And so it's going to be the conjugate base at the equivalence point that is going to define what your pH is. So let's say uh, again halfway up is around your pH of seven then your equivalence point pH is gonna be somewhere higher than that, a little bit higher than seven. It could be eight, it could be nine, but it's gonna be higher than seven. Between the pH of, uh, or between the points of the uh, initial pH and the equivalence point pH, something really unique happens during a weak acid titration. Uh, unique being when compared to the strong acid titration. In the strong acid case, we just saw this like straightforward kind of exponential looking curve right up to the equivalence point. With a weak acid, we actually, again, in the process of titrating, produce conjugate base. And about halfway, or rather exactly halfway, uh, between the initial point and your equivalence point, you're gonna end up hitting this really awesome region. Oh, that didn't line up. And this region, is awesome specifically because it is known as the buffer region. This region right in here, as you are undergoing the titration of your weak acid with strong base, you are going to have appreciable amounts of excess weak acid and conjugate base that has been produced during the neutralization reaction. And as we learned about last Friday, if uh, when undergoing a neutralization reaction, you have weak acid and conjugate base, you are going to have a buffer. And this buffer is going to be resistant to pH change, which is exactly why in this curve, we end up seeing uh, a very flat pH for a while. It's because we're adding strong base and we're not seeing much of a pH difference because we're working with a buffer. When in this region, anytime we are working with calculating pHs, we can use the Henderson Hasselbach equation, where our pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the concentration of your conjugate base divided by the concentration of your weak acid. If you are in the buffer region, then you can use the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. If you are not in the buffer region, then you cannot use the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. And we're going to be seeing some examples of like when to identify the buffer region, when you can use Henderson-Hasselbach in a couple of seconds. Now beyond the equivalence point, our uh, titration curve is going to end up looking very similar to the strong acid, strong base case. And that is because you are going to be entering a regime where you have excess strong base and your excess strong base because it completely dissociates uh, giving you a surplus of OH minus it is going to be what completely defines what your pH is going to be uh, if you are beyond the equivalence point it is the excess strong base uh, that you will use to calculate your pH if you are at the equivalence point, it is going to be the concentration of the conjugate base that is going to define what your pH is. If you're in the buffer region, it's going to be the balance of the weak acid and conjugate base, their concentrations being put into the Henderson-Hasselbach equation that will define pH. And if you're at the point where nothing, like no strong base has been added yet, it is the concentration of the weak acid that will define what your pH is. So all depending on where you are in this titration with the weak acid, we have suddenly a slightly more complicated case where there are many different things to consider. What is your balance of weak acid to conjugate base? Are you in the buffer region? Are you beyond the equivalence point? Are you at the equivalence point? Uh, so what we're going to do is look at four different calculations. The first calculation is going to be the calculation before 
any uh, base has been added to your weak acid, how do we calculate the pH and place it on our pH curve if we want an exact number to uh, put in here? Are we in the buffer region? This is calculation two, and if we're in the buffer region, how can we use Henderson-Hasselbach to meaningfully and quickly calculate a pH? Uh, we're gonna look at a calculation that is at the equivalence point and how we use the conjugate base to calculate the pH there. And then of course, last but not least, when we are beyond the equivalence point, how do we calculate the pH when we are just looking at some excess strong base in the titration or after the titration of the weak acid is complete? All right, so let's look at a problem where we are actually going to be titrating a weak acid. So let's take 20 milliliters of a 0 0.10 molar acetic acid solution, the Ka of our acetic acid is provided, 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth, this solution is being titrated with a 0.1 molar solution of NaOH. Uh, notice here, before even reading the rest of the problem, that we have two concentrations. We have a concentration for our weak acid, and we have a concentration for our strong base. The reason being is in this calculation, or over the course of these calculations, it's not the concentration that is unknown here. Instead, we don't know what our equivalence point is we're gonna to have to find our equivalence point. We're gonna to have to find the pH at our equivalence point. This is the nature of the pH problem with the titration sometimes. Sometimes we don't know what our equivalence point is and that's gonna be what we have to find instead. Uh, we're going to, in the process of finding the equivalence point, also be calculating the pH uh, after um, three other volume measurements. So here are the four total volume measurements that we are going to be working with. So uh, we're just going to start at zero. Uh, we'll then do 10 milliliters of the NaOH has been added, 20 milliliters has been added, and then finally 30 milliliters has been added. Again, so we can kind of cover our bases with those four previously defined pockets of the pH curve. The uh, balanced chemical equation that we are using below, or is given below, here we have the compound for acetic acid, CH3COOH, it is being neutralized by our strong base, the sodium hydroxide. In the process, it is creating some uh, sodium acetate and water. Now, we are going to be starting with the first calculation at zero milliliters NaOH added. This means that we are not even looking at the neutralization yet. Uh, none of the sodium hydroxide has been added. None of the sodium acetate or water has been produced. We are looking straight up at a flask or a beaker that is filled with simply 20 milliliters of sodium, or I mean of uh, acetic acid here. If we don't have any neutralization reaction, how is it that we can find the pH? Well, we've been doing this already. We have a weak acid that is present, weak acid that is present in water, right? It is in aqueous conditions. And if we have weak acid present in water, it will be undergoing some type of reversible reaction. This is going to uh, generate some CH3COO minus in solution, as well as some H3O plus. And as we've been talking about since getting into this entire unit, it is the concentration of the H3O plus that defines our pH. So finding the concentration of this H3O plus uh, via the dissociation of the acetic acid is going to be exactly what we are going to have to find. All right, so let's set up our ice table. Let's figure out what is the equilibrium concentration of our H3O plus as the acetic acid, as it's just hanging out, chilling in the flask, uh, how it's dissociating, how much H3O plus is being given off. Well, we are told what the concentration of our acetic acid is initially. It is 0 0.10 molar. We don't have any acetate or H3O plus initially, so the reaction is going to have to shift uh, in order to dissociate and uh, generate some of those products. So we're going to lose some of our uh, acetic acid here. We're gonna generate some acetic acid here, uh, or acetate ion and H3O plus here and here, meaning at equilibrium we will have 0 0.10 minus X of our acetic acid left over, and we will have generated 
some acetate ion and H3O+. And it is this X that we want to find since it will tell us what the concentration of our H3O plus is at equilibrium, which we then can use to find pH. So let's set up an equilibrium expression. Our Ka was equal to 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth, as was just told to us. This will be equal to the concentration of our acetate ion times the concentration of our H3O plus ion, all divided by the concentration of the acetic acid. All right, so if we plug in the equilibrium concentrations for the products, this will give us an X squared. A 0 0.10 minus X uh, is given for the reactant at equilibrium. And here we're gonna take a quick shortcut. We can observe that the magnitude of our Ka is at least a thousand times smaller than our initial condition here. Barely, but it is, which means we can ignore this change in X that is in the denominator. Uh, we're gonna be taking this shortcut a fair amount when working with weak acid, weak base kind of titration problems, especially if we are within the range where we can, we should, because these problems are going to be pretty tedious as we've already seen with the strong acid, strong base case. All right, so our goal is to find X. This gives us our concentration of the H3O plus at equilibrium and the concentration of our H3O plus at equilibrium, 0.00134 molar. Now we can use this to figure out what our pH is before any type of titration has began. What is the pH of acetic acid as it's just sitting in the flask if our initial concentration was 0.1 molar? Our pH is equal to 2.87. So the pH, as we see here initially, uh, is um, a little bit higher than the initial concentration of the HCl, and that is because, again, we are working with a weak acid. It is only partially dissociating into H3O+, we do not get a complete dissociation into H3O+. So it is going to be an acidic solution, just not as acidic as a strong acid was or would be. All right, so let's check that mark. We're gonna put this right here, that piece of information, a 2.87 uh, pH before any titration has begun. All right, so let's move on to our second data point. 10 milliliters of NaOH is now being added into our flask of the uh, weak acid, our acetic acid. I'm just gonna shorthand that with our HA. We are adding 10 milliliters of the NaOH. How is this going to affect our pH? Well, we predict it to increase. Um, in order to figure out exactly what our pH is, we're going to, in much the same way as before, now observe our neutralization reaction, figure out uh, what our limiting reactant is, what our excess reactant is, and now because we are working also, again, with the titration of a weak acid, we're gonna have to be paying attention what is the conjugate base concentration uh, as it is being produced during the course of this neutralization reaction. So what we're gonna do is, uh, much like before, organize all of our information. We have 20 milliliters of our acetic, acetic acid, uh, 0 0.10 molar concentration. Our sodium hydroxide at this point, we have added 10 milliliters into the flask. It also has a concentration of 0 0.10 molar. Uh, this means that at this point during the course of our titration, we have thus far mixed together 0.002 moles of our acetic acid and 0.001 moles of our sodium hydroxide. And I found these values by uh, converting our volume measurements into liters and multiplying them by our concentrations. Through dimensional analysis, we find these molar values. By comparing the molar values here, we can see that the sodium hydroxide is the limiting reactant. We have not yet reached the equivalence point, right? We don't have equal amounts of these two pieces yet. Uh, so we are kind of in parentheses, not at equivalence point because we still have a limiting reactant and it's the sodium hydroxide. So the sodium hydroxide will be completely used up since we are looking at the neutralization 
involving a strong base, there will be some complete reaction that occurs before any type of equilibrium is reached and we can find a pH. So we're going to subtract out all of our limiting reactant. We're going to subtract out the equivalent amount of our acetic acid, leaving us with 0.001 moles of the acetic acid. And on the product side, again, since we have to pay attention to that concentration of the conjugate base, we are going to also be adding 0.001 moles of the conjugate base. Once this conjugate base dissociates in solution, right, that sodium is going to go away, we're going to be left with the conjugate base of the acetic acid, which will have an influence on the pH. In order to figure out what our uh, you know, concentration of H3O plus is, we're going to have to figure out what are the concentrations of the acetic acid and the concentration of our acetate ion. So we're going to have to take both of these species and devolve, or divide them by the total volume that is present in solution, and we can find what the total volume is right here. Our total volume, V total, is equal to 30 milliliters, which is equal to 0 0.030 liters. Uh, we can see that both of the molar amounts of the acetic acid and the acetate ion are the same. They're both 0 0.001 moles. So if we take this molar amount, divide it by the volume total, that gives us a concentration of 0 0.00, nope, just one zero, 0 0.033 molar. And that's going to be for both of the acetic acid and the acetate ion. We are in the realms of our buffer region. We can identify that because the concentration of our acetic acid is equal to the concentration of our acetate ion. Because the concentrations here are equal, they are both 0.033 molar, we have a buffer. And because we have a buffer, we are not going to have to undergo the process of working with some complicated common ion effect, ice table, blah, blah, blah. We can use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to calculate what our pH is at this point in the titration. The Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the concentration of A minus divided by the concentration of HA. Our pKa is the negative log of our Ka, which is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. The log of the concentration of our acetate ion divided by acetic acid is 0 0.033 divided by 0 0.033 molar on both of those. The log of 0 0.033 divided by 0 0.033 is equal to zero since we're just taking the log of one, meaning that we are working with the ideal buffer where the concentration of our weak acid and conjugate base are the exact same, and the pH is going to be exactly equal to the pKa, which in this case is equal to 4.7. So the pH at the point where we are right now in the reaction is a 4.7. So we can see that we have increased the pH, we have added some base, so this makes sense, but we are now in this buffer realm. In other words, if we wanted to create a buffer solution that is somewhere around the pH of 5-ish, like 4.75-ish, 4.5-ish, we could use acetic acid to do that. Um, that would be a problem for another time. We are going to continue with what we are working on right now, finding the pH of our next step, which is after we have added 20 milliliters total of sodium hydroxide to our solution. All right, so let's reorganize our information down below in the table again. Because we are still working with a complete neutralization, we are going to have to organize. We're going to have to find our excess. We're going to have to find our limiting. We're going to have to pay attention to the conjugate base, uh, as well as both of the reactants, whichever one's going to be left over. So let's organize our information now that we are at the step where we are adding 20 milliliters of our sodium hydroxide. There is 20.0 milliliters of, uh, of the acetic acid. It has a 0.10 molar concentration. We are adding 20.0 milliliters of 
of a 0 0.10 molar concentration, both of these are the same, which means that when we uh, calculate how many moles we have of both the acetic acid and the sodium hydroxide, we have the same molar amount. Exclamation point. If we have the same molar amount, this signifies a very important point in the titration reaction. We are currently at the equivalence point. And we would have been able to predict this, yes, in advance, had we actually taken a pause and evaluated each of the uh, volume amounts. We would have been able to critically evaluate and see like, oh, hey, that's probably the equivalence point right there. We didn't do that. And now we have it in front of us. We you know, would have found it eventually. So the equivalence point uh, at the, for this reaction we have now reached, which means we do not have any excess reactant. Both the acetic acid and the sodium hydroxide are going to completely neutralize each other. There will be no excess, there will be no limiting, all of our reactants are going to be gone. At the equivalence point, we are only going to have conjugate base and water present in solution, and it's going to be the conjugate base that is going to define what our pH is going to be at this point. We have completely used up our 0.002 molar uh, acetic acid and sodium hydroxide, and we have created 0.002 mole amounts of the, or molar amounts, of the acetate ion in the process. In order to figure out what the concentration of our conjugate base is, we're going to have to take this molar amount and similarly, as we have been doing, divide it by the total volume that we have. The total volume can be seen by adding the two volume amounts that we have uh, you know, present in solution. We had 20 milliliters of acetic acid. We've added 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. This gives us a total of 40 milliliters that have been added. Uh, we can insert that into the denominator, uh, converting it into a liter amount instead of milliliters, which is equal to 0 0.040 liters. And this gives us a concentration at the equivalence point of our conjugate base of 0 0.05 molar. This is going to be the molar amount that is going to now define our pH. The acetate ion is all that is left. It is going to interact with the water that is around it to generate some OH minus. So let's see what that reaction looks like. We have our conjugate base, our acetate ion, CH3COO minus. At the equivalence point, it is all that remains with the water. It will be able to react reversibly with water since it is a base. It will be able to take uh, one of the hydrogens away from the water, generating or regenerating rather some of our acetic acid and also some OH minus. Since it is a base, again, it's pulled that hydrogen away from the water onto itself. But we don't have any acetic acid right now, right at initial conditions, our new defined initial conditions, as soon as we've hit the equivalence point and all of that sodium hydroxide has been neutralized, all of the acetic acid has been neutralized, we have 0.05 molar acetate ion, none of what were once our initial reactants. We don't have any of those anymore. We're gonna have to react with water to regenerate some. So we're going to lose some of our acetate, we're going to gain some of our acetic acid and our hydroxide, meaning at equilibrium we will have 0 0.05 minus x, x of our acetic acid, and x of our hydroxide. It is the x that we want to find since we're ultimately looking for pH at this point to kind of define our pH curve, plug in these numbers, we can draw a more accurate version of our uh, pH curve here. Uh, it's our OH minus that is going to be used to calculate our pH at the equivalence point. And we need to find the concentration of our OH by using the concentration of our acetate ion. So here now we are working with a weak base, meaning that we cannot use the Ka of our weak acid to figure out what our X is. If we want to set up an equilibrium expression in this case, it's going to have to be a Kb. Fortunately for us, the weak base we are working with 
is the conjugate base of the uh, weak acid that we already know it's Ka of. In other words, our Kb is going to be equal to the uh, equilibrium constant for water divided by the equilibrium constant for acetic acid. 10 to the negative 14th divided by 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5th. And this gives you a Kb of 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10, a very small Kb indeed. And we can set this up equal to the uh, you know, products divided by reactants, our x squared divided by 0 0.05 minus, minus x. And again, because the magnitude of our Kb is so small, we can ignore this change in x, meaning that our uh, expression here is going to be approximately equal to uh, x squared all divided by 0 0.05. And in rearranging and solving for x, which is the concentration of our OH minus, uh, we can find or would find a value of 5.3 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. We can use this value to find a pOH. I'm going to go this route this time, finding pOH first. Our pOH, which is equal to the negative log of the concentration of OH, is 5.3. And we can use this to find pH by taking 14 minus the 5.3, which gives us an 8.7. So to rewrite the uh, pHs that we have found so far, the pH initially was a 2.87, at 10 milliliters was a 4.7, and now at the equivalence point was an 8.7. We have one point left to find, one pH left to find, and it is going to be when we are now working beyond the equivalence point. What does the pH curve look like for a weak acid titration with a strong base if you're working with uh, or past the equivalence point? The way that we're going to set this up is again in the exact same way that we have set up our previous problems. We are going to assess our complete reaction, our complete neutralization with the strong base. We're going to be looking for our limiting reactant, our excess reactant, and again, we're going to take a peek at the concentration for our conjugate base uh, just to see what type of influence it's going to have. We're going to gather our information. We have 20.0 milliliters of a 0 0.10 molar acetic acid solution. We now have 30.0 milliliters of a 0 0.10 molar uh, sodium hydroxide solution meaning that if we want to convert these values into moles, which is going to be the useful unit for us when working with stoichiometry, we have 0.002 moles of acetic acid and 0.003 moles of sodium hydroxide. We can observe which one of these values is the lesser, and it's the acetic acid now that has the lesser molar value, meaning that the acetic acid is the limiting reactant it will be entirely eaten away, uh, losing all 0.002 moles of itself, leaving none behind. We are also going to lose 0.002 moles of the sodium hydroxide, leaving us with 0.001 moles of it left over. We are also going to generate 0.002 moles of the acetate ion, uh, since now we have used up that much of our limiting reactant can't create any more than what we have lost. So now our question is, what in the beaker is going to be affecting pH? What is going to be affecting pH the most? Is it going to be 0.001 moles of sodium hydroxide or 0.002 moles of our acetate ion? In comparing these two values, just by looking at them, we might assume that it's the acetate ion because we have a greater molar value of it. We have twice as many moles. But remember that the acetate ion is a weak base. In fact, we just calculated what the uh, P or what the Kb for this weak base specifically is. It's 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. This is a very small Kb, right? It's a very, very tiny uh, amount of dissociation or interaction that this acetate ion has with water. So yeah, we may have twice the molar amount, 
but proportionally, we're not going to have nearly as much dissociation or interaction with water as what our sodium hydroxide will have. Our sodium hydroxide, because it is a strong base, is going to be what defines our pH beyond the equivalence point. Yes, we do have a little bit of our uh, weak base present, and yes, it will influence our pH a little bit, but uh, within the range of significant figures, it's not going to have that much of an effect. In summary, when we are beyond the equivalence point, we are only going to be paying attention to the amount of excess strong base that has been left behind. The amount of excess strong base is going to be what defines our pH beyond the equivalence point. So if we have 0.001 moles of OH minus, we're going to have to figure out what is the concentration of our OH minus uh, in order to calculate what our pH is going to be. So we're going to have to take this amount and divide it, just go backwards, divide it by the total volume at the point where we are in the titration. The total volume we can see is the sum of the acetic acid volume and the sodium hydroxide volume, which is 50 milliliters. And 50 milliliters is equal to 0 0.050 liters. The molar amount then of our uh, hydroxide, our OH minus, is 0 0.02 molar. And if we wanna find our pOH, we're gonna take the negative log of the 0 0.02 molar, which is going to give us a pOH of 1.7. Our pH, which is 14 minus the pOH, is 12.3. As soon as we are beyond the equivalence point, our OH minus concentration is gonna take over and our solution is going to be uh, come very basic very quickly. All right, so those were the four points of interest on our pH curve when looking at a weak acid. We can assess similarly the points along the titration curve for a weak base that is being titrated with a strong acid, which is what we can see in the diagram on the left. Uh, if we break down our chart, our graph, as we did before, we're gonna have a point where we are uh, you know, at zero strong acid added we are going to look at a point that is halfway to the equivalence point, uh, a volume that is the equivalence point, and then a volume that is in excess of the equivalence point. Um, very similar to the four kind of ranges or pockets of space, um, you know, points during the titration that we looked at previously. When adding a strong acid to a weak base, we are going to end up uh, at the equivalence point with a pH that is slightly less than seven. That is because when our weak base is completely neutralized by our strong acid, we will only have conjugate acid present inside of solution. We would then uh, expect our pH at the equivalence point on our chart to be somewhere slightly below that of the pH of seven. Initially, we are going to have no strong acid present, which means we are going to end up with a basic solution. Much like the comparison of the weak acid to the strong acid initially, our weak base is going to have a slightly lower pH compared to that of a strong base. And that is because of the weak dissociation. Weak dissociation that a weak base undergoes when in the presence of water. Uh, also, similarly to the uh, titration of a weak acid with a strong base, when looking at a weak base with a strong acid, uh, as the titration begins, we are going to end up in some uh, pocket that is known as a buffer region here as well. The buffer region uh, will continue so long as we have uh, some of our weak base in the presence of its conjugate acid, which is created during the neutralization. Uh, and as the titration then approaches the equivalence point, 
we are going to see a sharp turn away from the uh, buffer region since now we are not going to have as much of an appreciable balance of our weak base to conjugate acid uh, and the pH is going to very then quickly plummet. Um, the pH will then pass through the equivalence point, that is this point here, the equivalence point, that inflection point, uh, mathematically speaking, on this curve, and then we enter the area of our titration where we have excess strong acid, where our pH is going to be very, very low and completely controlled by the presence of the excess amount of strong acid. So here we have a curve that is, again, kind of, of a, a vertical mirror image of the uh, previous titration that we just like looked at and kind of broke down. Uh, similarly to that previous case, we have four interesting pockets of space that we could analyze along this titration curve. The first is the initial point where it is only going to be the weak base that defines the pH. In this buffer region, it is going to be the combination of the weak base and conjugate acid that is created during the neutralization that will control the pH at the equivalence point where all of the weak base is used up. It is going to be the conjugate acid only that defines the pH. And then as we move beyond the equivalence point, it's only going to be the excess strong acid that matters. Oh, and that is it. We have finished chapter 17. I mean, congratulations, hats off to you guys for making it this far, um, especially given the conditions currently. Uh, I encourage any questions to be asked at this point, email, discord, otherwise, uh, because this chapter is very detail oriented. Again, it is very focused on your ability to be able to break down what is happening in the beaker. Is the neutralization reaction still occurring? What's my limiting reactant? What's my excess reactant? What conjugates do I have present? How can I calculate the pH during this titration? Or if a pH is given to you, how can you figure out where you are on that pH curve? What is happening in the beaker? Here we have a couple of suggested problems, all pertaining to acid-based titrations. Get that practice under your belts. Starting Wednesday, we are going to be moving into chapter 18, where we are going to be heavy shifting gears um, not completely leaving equilibrium in the dust, but we are not going to be talking about acids and bases anymore. We will be moving into redox reactions and revisiting that lesson from chapter 9, only in the reversible context. Until Wednesday, though, uh, you know, good luck on your homework. That assignment will be due on Wednesday, all pertaining to the titration reactions. Um, again, if you have questions, let me know. But until then, class is dismissed.